My fellow Americans, this was not a riot. This was a massacre. The year was 1921. America remembers one of the darkest moments in its history, the Tulsa Race Massacre. Hello, I'm Arnold Nino, and this is The Heat. One hundred years ago, Tulsa, Oklahoma was the site of a notorious race massacre. A white mob went on a rampage in an African-American community called Black Wall Street. Hundreds of blacks were killed and more than 10,000 people were left homeless. Some of the victims sought refuge in a local church. So this is the room where people hid in during the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. And in this very room, they came in through the windows and they were protected from the fire from the other side by this brick wall that was double, that is double-sided brick. And if you can imagine people coming into this space, hearing bombs going off outside, hearing people screaming, and hearing babies crying, and you're not knowing if you're next, but they were able to hide in this space. Well, joining us now to talk about this here in Washington to discuss the Tulsa Race Massacre is Annalisa Brunner. Her great-grandmother survived the riot and wrote about it as a journalist. With us, too, is Julianne Malvaux. She is a labor economist, author, and commentator. Also joining us is Hilary Shelton. He is the director of the NAACP's Washington Bureau. And from Maryland, we are joined by Jason Nichols. He is a senior lecturer in the African-American Studies Department at the University of Maryland College Park. Welcome to all of you to the show. And Annalisa Brunner, let me start with you. You are the great-granddaughter of Mary Jones Parish, who survived that massacre and then went on to write a first-hand account of what happened there. Uh, let us start by finding out why did this massacre take place in the... How did it start? Well, there for many years uh, was controversy about how it started. Uh, there it was a precipitating event where a young African-American of 19 years old, Dick Rowland, uh, was uh, supposed to have stepped on the foot of an elevator girl, uh, Sarah Page, 17 years old, a young white girl. She screamed uh, when they were in the elevator and he fled. That was uh, supposedly, as I said, the precipitating event uh, that led to a, an attempted lynching uh, to which uh, the Greenwood community responded. And so they went to the courthouse, uh, including some armed World War I veterans who had returned from uh, Battle Abroad. They were turned back when they offered their services to the sheriff, and eventually a scuffle happened. Uh, a rifle went off when a, uh, a white man, elderly white man, tried to uh, attack uh, a tall African-American war veteran. Uh, and uh, when the community, those community members returned to Greenwood, uh, they eventually had to fend off the white attackers. Uh, I said pretext uh, because um, we know now that it was really landlust and it was a pre-planned event as opposed to a spontaneous event. That's why it happened. Well, Annalisa, if we look at uh, what happened, I mean, more than 300 African Americans were killed by the mob. Over 10,000 people uh, were left homeless. Uh, and the neighborhood that was known as Black Wall Street was burned to the ground. What did you learn from your great grandmother's account of the massacre? What I learned was that community was a successful community, a well um, established community, and that it had all manner of people living and working together in concert cre to create a whole community. Uh, people like to emphasize that it was financially uh, independent. It was. Uh, but at the same time, in addition to the professional class, the doctors, the lawyers, the architects, the engineers, the pharmacists, etc., were just everyday Black people who went about their business working hard every day, uh, exhibiting thrift and uh, other economic uh, responsibilities. Uh, they were a cooperative community, and uh, they looked to themselves and to each other uh, for support. It was a successful and thriving, vibrant community, uh, which my uh, great-grandmother chronicles in her book, The Nation Must Awake. Uh, 
her firsthand experience as a survivor, along with my seven-year-old grandmother. And uh, later, she would also chronicle uh, the experiences of other survivors uh, in great detail. And so it was eye-opening when I learned of this. Uh, I learned of it at the same time uh, I got the book itself from my father in 1994. So it was, a, it was an awakening for me uh, in the sense that here was incontrovertible evidence uh, in writing, uh, performed and written in real time. Uh, and so uh, we have this written record uh, as a primary source that has been used over the decades uh, by uh, many scholars uh, who will say that this is the primary source that they used uh, to perform uh, their studies of this uh, horrible event. Julianne Malvo, tell us more about this Greenwood district of Tulsa, also known as Black Wall Street, as I said. Um, it was one of, as we just heard, one of America's most prosperous communities. It was a successful, thriving community. Why, why do you believe it was targeted by white racists? Uh, it, was, it was simple economic envy. And I'm so happy to have to be in the same space as Annalise. But it is simple economic envy. Black people had a thriving community. We did everything for ourselves. We built our own library because we couldn't use the other library. Our own hospital. The first person to own an automobile in Tulsa was a black man. And he was so entre entrepreneurial. Once he bought his car, he figured out how to fix cars, and he became the first person to have an auto repair place in Tulsa. White people lynched a white man the year before, 1920. He was a ne'er-do-well who had basically killed uh, a taxi, what we, we today would call a taxi driver. And when they lynched him, they said, if we can lynch... <laughs> I, I'm not laughing because it's not funny, but it kind of is. Annalise will get this. If we can lynch a white man, we can lynch a Negro. In other words, okay, now we have permission. I have the utter privilege of knowing Dr. Olivia Hooker, who was one of the survivors of uh, the massacre until she died in 2019. And I was privileged to be one of the black women who were able to eulogize her. Dr. Hooker said that white folks had been stockpiling weapons for several years in reaction to the wealth that black people were building. When the incident happened between Dick Rowland and Sarah Page, and one must know that Dick Rowland's mother posited that the two of them were perhaps romantically involved, neither of them survived the history books, but when the event incident occurred, one of the white newspapers actually ran a headline that said to lynch a Negro tonight. It was a plan to lynch a Negro tonight. Months later, when the governor of Oklahoma put together a commission to study why this occurred, the answer was too many N-words, and the N-word was not Negro, have too much money. So this was really just a nod, and it's always great to be with you, by the way. Uh, it's, this was all about economic envy. Black people had too much. You understand the time period between 1880 and 1910. In 1880, the ratio of black dollars to white dollars, of one black dollar for every 36 white dollars. By 1910, it had dropped to one black dollar for every 16 white dollars in a 30-year period, because black people were accumulating. And that's why you end up with Jim Crow raw laws. That's why you ended up with Wilmington, North Carolina. I mean, see, Tulsa was horrible. Right. There's so many other Tulsas. That's why you ended up with all that, because too many black people had too much money, and white people could not stand it. Hillary Shelton, President Biden went to Tulsa this week. In fact, he's the first US president in 100 years to visit the site of the massacre. Uh, he did address the country from there. Let's listen to part of what he had to say. A hundred years and the first president to be here during that entire time. And in this place, in this ground, to acknowledge the truth of what took place here. For much too long, the history of what took place here was told in silence, cloaked in darkness, 
But just because history is silent, it doesn't mean that it did not take place. Hillary, how significant was that visit by President Biden to Tulsa? And uh, what does it mean for America trying to acknowledge what happened 100 years ago? I think first, as we talk about the people of Tulsa, as we heard at the beginning of the, of the show, the recognition of what had happened, the information was very much there. There was no real secret, just no interest in letting other folks know about it. But let me say this, too. As you think about what was happening in Tulsa, we knew those stories in the African-American community all over the country, and we did talk about it. We had to talk about it because it was also in the context of other issues of so-called race riots along these lines. We knew what happened in Springfield. We knew what happened in Rosewood and other places. We knew the stories. So very well for the people of Tulsa, and I, I, I'm not from there, but certainly we have someone on here that's an expert in that area. That story getting out and having it recognized by the most powerful person in the United States of America, the president, made a huge difference. It also makes a huge difference as we think about it in a broader sense. The issues of reparations to repair many of the damages done to African Americans along these lines, and certainly the people of Tulsa deserve greater recognition and certainly to be compensated for the damages done. Those dirty little secrets that were kept and those that made so much money off of destroying an African American community that was thriving at the rate that they were. So the issues there are, we knew what was going on, we're telling the story now, so hopefully, with the power of the presidency and legislation pending in Washington around reparations and the real desire to make sure that people and families and even lineages of families are made right, it's a powerful time for that story to become a better known and to have the authority of the president of the United States as we discuss it. Jason Nichols, uh, there was no justice for African Americans in the wake of this massacre. In fact, a civil rights professor wrote an opinion piece in the Washington Post, and this is what he said. He said, to this day, not a single criminal act has been prosecuted for murder, theft, arson, or assault in the Tulsa massacre. You know, this is a country where we have politicians tell us all the time that this is a country of laws, that no one is above the law. But how does one explain this? Nobody prosecuted. Well, I think that was kind of commonplace uh, for that period and the period following. You know, we have people who get away with, with racial crimes. Uh, and the fact that in this particular case and in many others, it was the state that was involved in the crime. So, uh, you know, the state holding itself responsible is going to be rare. Um, and this is something that African Americans, as your, as your previous guest, uh, you know, stated. I, I definitely think in terms of reparations, I, I believe Joe Biden already said in private, at least it's being reported by Politico, that he's not actually really uh, looking forward to, to reparations or that it's not going to happen, probably. Um, but it is good for his acknowledgement. It is good for the country to acknowledge the wrongs that it has done. And, and in this particular period, you know, uh, I think Dr. Malvo mentioned you know, 2019, you had, of course, the so-called Red Summer. Then you had uh, Okoy, Florida in 2020, and Tulsa in 2021. And it's good that we're finally acknowledging these things and acknowledging the crimes that have occurred and the fact that no one has been held responsible. And the whole damn system is guilty as hell. And we need to, uh, to acknowledge that the system it's guilt is guilty and that we uh, need to hold it accountable and try to make changes for the future. I think that that involves restitution, uh, not only for the people who are direct victims, but for the communities themselves. When we look at Tulsa, of course, as your uh, your previous guest stated, you know, that community was was destroyed. People were displaced uh, and wealth for generations was affected in Tulsa, uh, in the Greenwood section and, and in North Tulsa. So I think the entire community needs uh, restitution for what occurred uh, in Tulsa and in other places throughout the country. And that's why we have this enormous gap in, in wealth. And uh, the last thing that I, I'll just say uh -huh. is that, you know, like Dr. Malvo stated, this was economic jealousy. And that's where almost all lynchings came from, whether it was a massive amount of violence that, that occurred, like, like a massacre, like in Tulsa, 
or it was an individual lynching, a lot of times, as proven by Ida B. Wells or Ida Wells Barnett, it was about economics in the long run. It was about uh, the almighty dollar. So I think we need to acknowledge that as well. And Eliza, you know, as I said, sorry, go ahead. Adana, if I just said one thing, mm -hmm. it's really interesting when we look at this to understand that a massacre in Greenwood in Oklahoma affected black people all over mm -hmm. the country. Richard Wright, in his book, Black Boy, writes about walking with his head down in fear of being lynched. There were 5,000 lynchings in this country that we can document. There are probably more. But any one lynching mm -hmm. had a chilling effect on African-American economic accumulation and ac African-American self-actualization. Um, so I'm glad that my brother mentioned uh, Ida B. Wells yeah. uh, because the first lynching she documented had nothing to do. See, white folks hid behind the notion that black men were raping white women. Please. Um, the fact is that um, black people were accumulating. The first lynching she documented was that of Tommy Moss, who was lynched because he had the nerve to start a grocery store, the people's grocery, down the street from a store owned by a white man. And the white man couldn't take the competition, so he basically created a fight between two children over marbles, and three men were lynched for that. And Elisa, you know, as I said uh, earlier on, 300 African Americans were killed by the mob in this massacre. Uh, but there are still questions over what happened to those who died. I mean, there is, we understand there's unmarked graves, there's evidence of mass burials. Do we know what happened to those who died? Well, it's wonderful that you should bring this point to the forefront. Even as we speak, and I was in Tulsa up until just yesterday and visited the Oak Lawn Cemetery where they are doing an archeological excavation to uh, uncover what are suspected to be unmarked graves of victims of this terrible, terrible massacre. Uh, in my great grandmother's book, she says that people reported seeing corpses floating down the Arkansas River, which runs through the heart of Tulsa. And so uh, we are at this point beyond uh, trying to uh, understand if this has happened. Again, it's incontrovertible that it happened. And uh, we are applying modern, modern forensic uh, archaeology yeah. to uncovering some of those graves. Uh, I spoke with uh, a few people outside of the graveyard, and uh, there were fences around making sure that human remains, should they be discovered, and some were. Uh, were uh, shielded from the gawkers. Uh, so this is an ongoing and open wound within Tulsa itself, the heart of the city. Yeah. Uh, and we see that these people, uh, if they are exhumed and uh, found to be victims of the race massacre, will receive at last, 100 years later, a proper burial. Right, and what happened to those who survived this massacre? Well, I will tell you what happened in my family. Um, those who survived, some stayed and rebuilt. My great-grandmother, who lost her school and business uh, in this uh, slaughter, this organized uh, violence, uh, again, by the state, as, as has been stated here, uh, she was commissioned by the Interracial Commission to uh, make an accounting of exactly what happened. Her book describes not only the events themselves, but some of the economic losses. Uh, she does a tally. Uh, and names names in terms of who and how much they lost at the time. So it is uh, quite an important document, as you can well imagine. There was a rebuilding, and within some years uh, uh, after the massacre itself, uh, business was booming again. Tulsa was an oil town, mm -hmm. and much of the wealth that flowed into Greenwood and turned over several times within the community came from uh, the oil industry. Black people, because obviously of racism, were forbidden from working within the oil industry. Mm -hmm. But they did, uh, as persons who were in that region, uh, benefit from the oil industry dollars. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, not only were there prof people in the professions who were servicing the community, there were people who did work in white Tulsa and brought their dollars back home to Greenwood. And so uh, it's one of the reasons why that area was settled in the first place, uh, oil.
uh, and uh, in my family. My great, my great grandmother stayed, as I yeah. said. My grandmother, who lived through the massacre at the age of seven, mm -hmm. eventually relocated to uh, San Francisco, uh, where I was born. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we did have um, symptoms within the family of what had happened, though not necessarily direct. Uh, we know that uh, trauma, abuse, um, living through those kinds of things, and this, let's, let's be clear, this was an act of warfare uh, that was committed up upon the citizens, airplanes flying overhead, dropping incendiary devices, uh, so the buildings were burning from uh, the top down, uh, marauders coming through with uh, kerosene and torches, lighting the buildings from the bottom up, flushing people out of their homes uh, in the dark and shooting them as they, as they tried to escape. The quarter was surrounded. And so this was a horrific event. We know today that PTSD results directly to adults and children yeah. who uh, witness th this kind of uh, barbarity yeah. being unleashed within their communities, dead bodies all around, as uh, Mother Viola Fletcher said to Congress as she, as she testified uh, to her truth of what she had seen. Uh, my family, as I said, re uh, yeah. at my grandmother and my father resettled in San Francisco but we suffered through um, loss of uh, income and uh, eventual uh, substance abuse problems within my family. Julian Melvo, uh, here's something else. Uh, this is an episode in American history which has been largely ignored by the history books. Was there a deliberate attempt to cover this up, to forget about it? Oh, absolutely. First of all, many of the newspapers that I've referenced, they've disappeared. They've utterly disappeared. So the to lynch a Negro tonight headline, I can't find. I've wow. been in the Library of Congress, but it's referenced in other people's work. So we know that it occurred. Um, Dr. Olivia Hooker, who, as I mentioned, was, was my dear friend and, uh, and a survivor, uh, talked about the accumulation of weapons uh, in 19, 1920, 21, before Tulsa. Her dad owned a department store that had a safe in it. So some of the few people who were able to come out economically okay did so because even though his store was burnt, the safe was there. Yeah. And he and a couple of other people from the NAA and other organizations traveled the country trying to raise money to try to make people whole. But what she said is, this is a story that was swallowed. There was even a white man who was a, um, and his name doesn't come to you right now, but he was part of the American Red Cross. And he wrote a book that was suppressed for more than 20 years, where he documented some of the losses, what had happened, mm -hmm. the economic envy, the utter ugliness. As an example, people were interred yeah. in basically in a camp. Black women who had been doctor's wives, have been attorneys themselves, could only leave that camp if they were willing to do domestic work for white people. But that was only documented 20 years later. So, you know, it, it was a deliberate attempt. Dr. Hooker used to say, the, she said, she, I can't prove it, those, those planes were U.S. planes. Yeah. She believed they were World War I planes. Yeah, there was a, it was a cover-up. So, just one quick thing, Anand. Yeah. So the, here, so Oklahoma just passed this law mm -hmm. that said you can't teach critical race theory, nor can you teach anything that makes anybody feel guilty or uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think, Annalise, that uh, Tulsa was uncomfortable? Enslavement was uncomfortable? This is the craziest, you know what, I've ever seen where cities and states are saying, we don't want to know the truth, so yeah. we're going to yeah. outlaw a truthful curriculum. Yeah. Hillary, um, you know, the battle for civil rights in America has been a long battle. We look at this long arc of this struggle. How important is it for Americans to be fully aware of this Tulsa massacre 100 years later? Well, I think it's crucial. There are big gaps in our history. If you think about the development of any country, it's done step by step and stage by stage. Since we're looking at what happened in Tulsa 100 years ago, we're also thinking about the progress that people made. Don't forget, aside of a, a few, the richest people that live in our country inherited their wealth. That is, passed from generation to generation. What we have in Tulsa is an, an awful example. 
of what happens when you interfere with that process. And the way that interference happened was also just outrageous and horrific. So as we're thinking about and looking at these challenges today and recognizing and seeing these things, and even having them acknowledged by the sitting president of the United States, yeah. we know that we have to find ways to make things right. That is to restore that progress that should have been able to happen if we hadn't had the, the violent interaction and the cover-ups that were done by even governments, both local, state, and federal governments. So as we look at trying to repair these problems, looking at the challenges that it lays before us, all that must be taken into consideration and an accounting must be made. And entire families and, and generations need to be compensated. Yeah. what very well happen and interfere with the opportunity for African Americans to move well. As we're looking at what were the discussions that we're having now yeah. about race issues and those that want to actually whitewash it out yet again, yeah. we know that a big part of that is so that those economic gains that were made by those in that awful way, that is, white Americans stealing African American wealth, can be corrected. It means that we'll have to look at these economic institutions that actually flourish as a response to all these problems. So in essence, there's still much that needs to be done and understanding what happened and moving then from that understanding of that awful tragedy right. to how we correct it is crucial. Jason, as uh, Hillary says, there is still much to be done. Uh, the United States, as we know, is still dealing with significant race issues. The Black Lives Matter movement has refocused its attention on the need for racial justice in the United States. Um, 100 years after Tulsa, Oklahoma, why is the U.S. still struggling with this? Well, I think, uh, as your other guests have said, is that we've never really reckoned with it. Um, and the thing is, after Tulsa, there were, first of all, there were many other acts of, of terrorism uh, exacted yeah. on black communities. Uh, we can go even to, I believe, 1968 with Orangeburg, you yeah. know, uh, in, the, in the early 80s in, in Philadelphia. With the um, with the move massacre, we we've had so many acts uh, that have been that have destroyed black wealth and and destroyed black lives um, continually. And then of course when we talk about more or other systemic issues, right. uh, you know they've existed since then and we haven't reckoned with them. And even when we create laws, we haven't enforced them like fair housing. Yeah. So still suffering from these things, and now we don't even want to talk about it, as Dr. Malvo pointed out. Now we're outlawing even having the conversation. So now uh, we are continuing to have these issues. We're turning a blind eye to it. Right. We can't talk about what happened 100 years ago. Yeah. We can't even talk about what's happening right now at this moment. Jason. I have to go. We have run out of time, but thank you for, and thanks to all of you for this great discussion. That is it for another edition of The Heat. Thanks for joining us. We will see you the next time.